Thank you for joining us. I'm Gord Long. As always, it's my pleasure to have back with me today Charles Hugh Smith, well-followed, prolific writer on the web, who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Time once again to exchange some ideas, which I always look forward to. Uh, Charles, I failed to mention your latest book, Burnout, Reckoning and Renewal, the last time we were together. Do you want to give a quick shout out to our listeners on it? I have the cover on the screen now. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, yeah, it's like I've, I've burned out. And so I wanted to write about my experiences and, and actually the topic that we're going to discuss today, the stagflation and, um, the very challenging decade that we're, that we're entering. I think there's, um, that's part of why I wrote the book is because the, the pressure on, um, most of us will be um, severe. And so many of us will burn out or approach burnout. And so I wrote the book to try to help people who are struggling with um, the kind of overwork um, and stress that, that breaks us down. And so we have to protect ourselves as, as we enter the, um, the challenging decade of stagflation ahead. I need to stress with our new viewers that this is not an interview. We do these videos as a way of us productively dialoguing the important trends that we're together identifying and simply make our discussions available to the public for those that might be interested or want to contribute comments, which we, which we truly welcome and, and value. When we first started discussing what we would focus on in, in this session, you had just finished reading my annual thesis paper and suggested there were a number of areas that you had been writing on that you felt were also worth uh, tying into it. And that is what we'll be focused on in this session. My annual thesis paper, just to kick this off, this year was entitled A Great Stagflation. To do this, we felt it best to begin with me giving a quick familiarization of the paper, then have Charles talk to the five areas shown here on this agenda slide, which Charles highlighted as worth further discussion. In the way of positioning the annual thesis paper, we do this annually at matasi.com, and it is important to understand why we do it and how we arrive at the subject. We've been doing these papers for 14 years, and they're listed here on the left. And we do them because they are where our research and writing is leading us, and therefore, we take the time to flush it out in detail. So as it evolves, we are better prepared to understand what we'll begin to witness in the news reports and our writing investigations. Otherwise, frankly, we miss the significance often of some unfolding developments because they're like a glacier. They're longer term and you kind of put them to a side, but, but they're really critical. And we follow a very structured process called the process of abstraction that begins with over 40 regularly changing tipping points, which we continue to group, then synthesize into themes and roadmaps. And the predecessor of Matasi.com back in the late 90s was actually called tipping points because either the kind of the foundation which we, we start from and bridge to. With that as an approach, we explore what is happening and developed a consolidated paper of exploration. And this year's paper, as the table of content here shows, it was 88 pages. And some years that's actually been double that in size. But we have found that the shorter the better. And therefore, we leave out a lot in an attempt to zero in on what the real drivers are and how to best formulate an investment thesis that will make best use of our investment capital. Because, you know, we at Matasi are investors. We're not publishers. We make a living by investing. Well, you know, the publishing helps pay some expenses, but no, we, we're investors. So this is why we do it. And our conclusion is that we are entering what we refer to as the beta drought decade, an era of slow economic growth, heightened levels of inflation, and chronic unemployment of living wage workers will face waves of both inflation and deflation, but in different ways, as you would expect. And we'll have difficulties financing what we perceive, what we want, since we'll be facing problems paying for what we actually need on a daily basis. So what we want, we have to finance, and that we're going to have problems with that. But what we need, we pay cash for or have to have the money we're going to have difficulties with that. That's the squeeze. This will lead to eventually a debt crisis and eventually a reassessment of fiat currencies. And a lot of this outlook is becoming evident to most. The real issue is actually the timing. 
If you get it wrong, you miss out on major investment opportunities in directions, markets, and investment instruments. There's almost no question that the major captions here will occur. But how big or small they'll be in terms of um, amplitude and timing are the variables. And once you have the roadmap, you can start to adjust that. Because I can assure you, it isn't going to be as pretty as this map kind of looks uh, right here. Any comments on any of this, Charles, so far? Yeah, um, Gordon, I just want to pat you on the back a bit about if you just look at the titles of your 14 years of annual thesis, every one is still in um it's still in uh, having an effect. In other words, we're living with all of these currency wars, financial repression, crisis of trust, new world order. <laughs> I mean, it's just like all of the things you've described over the last 14 years and you and I have discussed are um, still in, in dynamics that are affecting the, the current situation globally. Right. And so they didn't they didn't end. They're, they've just simply been. Um, processed as, as as policies and as policy reactions. And so um, what you're describing, I'll just kind of try to summarize, that the stagflation that you're describing is actually an extremely complex process. It's not just one thing like the Fed did this and so we get stagflation. No, no. It's, it's, the, it's the result of all these dynamics playing out in real time as as central banks and states and corporations and everybody responds by trying to keep everything glued together. And so um, it's, I just wanted to mention the complexity of what, of the, of the stagflation you're describing. Charles, that really came out. And I, I think I was saying to you earlier, I had a whole conclusion of where we we're going with stagflation when I began to write the, the thesis paper from the work. Cause I, you know, we, do writings on it in terms of our weekly newsletters and videos and everything else. But as I really got into it and I started to do the detailed scrubbing, and we went back to World War I and all of our charts and started overlaying unemployment rates with inflation rates, with uh, globe GDP, with money supply, rate of changes in the Fed rates, we started to see all sorts of strong, strong correlations that aren't clearly evident when you're looking on daily and weekly and monthly charts or maybe even over a one-year period. But you see they take longer, but they, they affect the, – they're, they're all tied together, and they work together consistently and with fairly consistent patterns, patterns that are really how human nature reacts to things. One of our conclusions is it's like watching a glacier. You stop paying attention to it, but it's steadily moving. If you're just going to trade it on a daily basis, not not going to work. But if you don't do it right, you're going to get crushed. It'll run right over top of you. And if you can get on a trend at the right time, it's an easy ride. There are a number of notable occurrences that fit into these unfolding developments um, that I'm showing here. And I just want to run through those uh, briefly, Charles. The first is what we've often referred to as the Great Moderation. This chart tracks the inflation rate, as I said, going back to World War I. And it illustrates the fact that inflation peaks have been quite muted since the Volcker uh, crushing of inflation. And though they have recently spiked to the upper dotted trend line shown here, what is important is that when we have elevated inflation historically over 5% for any kind of sustained period, we're having that sustained period right now, it is very destabilizing overall and can be expected to lead to a period of economic stagnation and stagflation, which we're only beginning to really see come into existence now. And it was building before, and it's a reason why we even saw the 5% embreachment as we went through it when we looked at this inflation chart. This slide I'm showing here is much too busy, but it brings together some of the points we've been making that the individual charting work we did on each of these three key elements of stagflation since World War One, And what it becomes clear is to us is the self-reinforcing mechanisms that begin to occur. And our conclusions as we show here, are that we should be expecting, you know, stagflations ahead. And that we're going to see elevated inflation. We think it's going to be 4% or higher. It's not going to get much lower. We're going to start to live in that kind of real world. Growth, we think, is going to start to be more times than not below 1%. Maybe a little higher, 2, 3, 4 We're not going to see that. Next foreseeable few years, there will be exceptions on quarterly basis as the government throws money at problems and whatever. But generally, that's what it says. And major unemployment, and this is the real problem. 
that we see is going to be the breaker in there. It's not inflation or economic growth as problematic as that is. And that unemployment is going to be 10% or so. And that's three to four times the current levels that we've seen. We used to lay off 30, 40, 50,000 people. All these companies have really pared back. They don't have the same numbers of staff. So when they lay off 1,000, 2,000, that is a dramatic impact to these corporations. Maybe not as much financially, but to the impact of their ability to continue to deliver products. 102 companies in the Silicon Valley area, three counties that are all going through layoffs, but they're all 100, 120, 40 people. But as a percentage, and that's the key today, what is the percentage of their total employment is the big number. And then you start to really start to see the impact. And these are jobs that pay good living standards, living wages. These are the one jobs that pay for the houses that they can afford. When these people start losing their jobs, it's going to be very significant in terms of stagflation. Any comments on that, Charles? I think that um, you're right that um, to, to bring up these three points, because you can see that they're all pressuring the cost of living and um, and disposable income. You know, so as people lose their jobs or have to downgrade and take whatever job they can get that pays less, then they have less disposable income. And so how can you support a, um, a consumer economy um, unless you just uh, borrow more money? And of course, then you, you end up with the debt crisis you mentioned um, as the, the end game of the whole thing. But um, I'm curious to hear your explanation of the destabilizing rate shocks. We really looked at COVID. We believe we've yet to fully feel the real longer-term impact of COVID-19. COVID has effectively acted as a global destabilizing shock. The shock is going to be more seriously felt in global financial rates. And specifically, we're going to see higher bond term risk premium in terms of the debt market. And we're going to see higher equity risk premiums likely throughout this whole beta decay decade. That's where it's going to start to show up. That drives costs up to offset risks and these risk premiums. And there's just almost no doubt that's going to happen. That's actually going to drive inflation. That's going to push other areas that we don't yet see are already beginning to happen. And this goes back to when I'm saying how they overlap and tie in. And people don't pay a lot of attention to the credit markets and the bond markets because they're slower moving glaciers, but it's already happening. And it stems from COVID. And what happened with the supply chains, what happened with the overreaction, the, the whipping effect where we overbuilt, now all of a sudden we're overstocked and back and forth. It'll stabilize and damp, the wave will dampen out. But it's changed the whole view of risk. And with the amount of leverage we have on the system and borrowing to our short term, not long term, to maintain that risk and that money being available and sub- a substantial collateral to support it is problematic. That's the big shift we started to really see coming out in our analysis. Yet there's another really important reality, what we refer to as the event horizon. And stagflation is something you want to avoid at all costs. It is like a black hole. Once you get below the event horizon, your fate is sealed. And with stagflation, that is manifested. To fight inflation, you need higher rates. To fight slow growth, you need lower rates. To fight unemployment, you must have growth, and you must have positive real investment returns. And so what you end up with is stagflation is a catch-22 trap. Once you get into it, it's a bear to get out. And Volcker, when he got out of it, In 1980, driving interest rates up to 19%, we could do it, but that's what it took. We can't do that again. So how are we going to get out of it? Oh, we'll get out of it, but it's going to be painful and it's going to affect our standards of livings. And this is going to be make volatile markets more volatile and the pricing of risk a central issue. So the central problem we face here, though, having just said that, is that we've been lying to ourselves for decades And inflation and growth statistics have been steadily and politically manipulated since the early 1980s. Statistical gaming, and you and I, Charles, have talked about this many times over this last decade, is that the statistical games such as hedonics, substitution, imputation, changing baskets, and and the list goes on, have already placed us below that event horizon. And we've been unwittingly accepting current government reporting. And guys like John Williams, that you and I both know over at Shadow Stats, 
has a site dedicated to reconciling these bogus games at play. But the bigger point is that it's lulled us or fooled us or fooled the powers to be into believing the numbers. And that's we're into a trap. Now, how do we get out? Because we're below that event horizon. That's another hidden issue. And so we'll lie. We'll cheat. We'll just statistics again. But we're still falling into this black hole, potentially, of of the Catch-22. There is obviously a lot of detail in the document, so I apologize for not being more thorough here. And I went on maybe too long, but I wanted to be as brief as I could so we had lots of time, Charles, for you to go through some other additional thinking here. So this year, for the first time, we made the thesis paper actually available for download on a pay-for-view basis at the website. I recommend it for at least a few charts in it that you'll find you will you will hang up and, and pay a lot of attention to them. If you come, then and I also please check out our free weekly newsletter where we're always talking about all of these uh, subjects. Charles, let me turn it over to you now to highlight your thoughts and important considerations on the great stagflation we feel at least is uh, ahead of us. Well, thank you, Gordon. And I'm going to start by just mentioning um, two topics I often uh, discuss, which is globalization and financialization. And they are the dynamics that were deflationary for the last several decades. In other words, globalization led to um, the the, uh, the production, off, offshoring of production, the lowering of costs due to using uh, production um, now being done in countries with low wages, no environmental standards, and so on. So that actually raised the purchasing power of of dollars or um, and in um, our economy, right? Because the costs were reduced by globalization. Financialization was the reduction in the cost of money and the the risk premium that you described. In the great moderation, risk was um, kept falling along with interest rates. And so the cost of, of, of borrowing money also kept falling. So those two were forces were hugely deflationary. And, and so that's why we got growth over the last couple of decades. Well, now those are reversing for all the reasons that, you know, we've discussed, right? And as you say, risk premium is going to be rising because financialization has run out of rope. There's those, um, both of the globalization and financialization have reached marginal returns. In other words, you're no longer, we can no longer count on those creating growth and employment and increasing the purchasing power of our, of our money. It's, it's actually reversing now. And that's, that's the kind of, to me, the context of, of stagflation. But, um, I also want to talk a little bit about how we've become a credit asset bubble economy, right? We've seen three bubbles rise. In the last 25 years, right, where credit bubbles generate asset bubbles, which then pop and have devastating effects. And so we, you and I covered this uh, back in um, 2020. Um, and one consequence of this is the reverse wealth effect that all the people that owned assets, bought assets early, stocks, bonds, real estate, housing, um, they've um, enjoyed a tremendous increase in their in their wealth, but it's been unearned. Right. I mean, you know, your house doubled or tripled or quadrupled in value without you having to actually do any improvements. And so that kind of uh, bubble wealth has um, lead, led to um, higher consumption, of course, because we we feel richer and we, we can tap some of our wealth. And um, so when the credit bubble pops, which is inevitable, you know, credit uh, expansion slows, then the asset bubble that's dependent on the credit bubble will also pop, right? And so when that happens, then people will have less of this unearned wealth. You know, they'll see a, a decline in their assets and then they'll feel um, less wealthy. And so they'll cut back on consumption. And because the top 10% own almost 90% of the um, financial assets in, in the United States, and they're responsible for between 40 and 50% of all consumption. When they get hit by the reverse wealth effect, that's going to have a, a huge effect on consumption. And, and that's, of course, the, the foundation of our economy. So that's going to be consequential. Charles, as you said earlier, it's just devastating. Think about this. The U.S. economy is close to 70% consumption. The closest to us is maybe 52%. Most countries are down around 34%. And we've always said 
how much more can we consume? But if, if the consumer's tapped out, and we even slow it down to, say, 60, 55 percent, that has profound impact. And I believe that we've already rolled into this reverse wealth effect. Once it starts to cascade, it cascades, as you said, through the credit market. But all of a sudden, every loan is out there. Is it has to be collateralized. So what's the collateral? So as the collateral falls, it forces selling. So it ends up the reverse wealth effect forces the the consumption to slow down because there's just not enough lending that can go on. It can't be financed, and that's the problem as you're articulating. Very good point. Um Gordon, and you've often focused on on collateral, that when your house triples in value, you now have triple the collateral that you can then borrow against. And when the asset falls in in value, your collaterals now declined as well. So you can't uh, borrow more money, at least at least without with with uh, without having any extra collateral. So that those reverse, and that's part of the credit crisis that we were anticipating. My second point, real quickly, is just energy. That it's, I think, it's a, a, a stagflationary impact for a lot of reasons, and we could do a whole program on that. But you can see the effects of of, of energy becoming scarce or being um, scarcity driven by geopolitics, by depletion, by um, changes in policy. All those are factors, but I think energy is something to look at as a, as a stagflationary force. And then my point about reshoring, um, and I'll try to explain this as uh, succinctly as I can, is that people look at the 1970s. And of course, that was a stagflationary decade with a lot of similarities to what we're discussing now. Um, and one of the factors was that um, the United States and many other developed countries chose at that time to make a policy reversal of, of, um, of just polluting, you know, their environment as a, as a way of, of stimulating growth and, and maximizing profits, right? It, 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 the rivers were basically dumping grounds and so was the, the uh, nation's air. So the, the environmental controls of, that were introduced in the early seventies required trillions of dollars in today's money, of investments to clean up that pollution, to redo um, the industrial base of the United States and make it more efficient and um, and clean uh, clean it up, and and that required they didn't create profits, you know it actually was nothing but costs. <laughs> the the benefits we we only got the benefits after a decade or two, you know because as you say these things are glacial. It takes a tremendous amount of time and effort to to um, remobilize, you know, and and re-engineer your industrial base, and so you don't get a payoff right away. But the payoff is huge down the road, and so now we have clean rivers, we have much cleaner air. Yes, we still have pollution concerns, but far less than we had in 1970. And so I'm anticipating that the reshoring that is being geopolitically driven by necessity. That's going to be another uh, capital sink. We're going to have to invest a lot of money to reshore the production that was offshore. And we're not going to gain like quick profits because actually the ex- the expenses are going to be uh, continuous and the payoff is not going to be in profit. It's going to be in national security, it is securing our resources and our supply chains. So that's another stagflationary force. And I don't know, you, you probably could um, add something to that whole reshoring topic. I actually can, Charles. You make the, a really important point about in the 70s, the amount of money that was spent on environmental cleanup that needed to be done. Now we're seeing reshoring. A lot of the land up here in the Northeast, when we want to build a housing development or a new factory, we used to have so many mills here that treat it with acids and various chemicals that were then just dumped into the ground and dumped into the area, that if you want to do any redevelopment in a certain area, the environmental costs to bring the land up to a certain level before you can start the construction are so significant that I've seen site after site around in the southeastern New England. It goes on for a year of digging up the ground, changing the groundwater, putting in sand down 
10, 20 feet to create an environment that is suitable to begin the factory to be, or whatever the development is. In a lot of cases, it's apartment complexes that are going in. That's cost that's being baked right into eventually the rents for the houses in low cost housing areas and, and the houses, ever mind some of this reshoring factories. The point is here that there's more costs. It's good costs. I support the environmental, but all of a sudden you're adding in I don't know, I'm guessing 20, 25% just to meet environmental standards before you even put a shovel in the ground. Yeah, that's an excellent point, um, Gordon. And of course, it, uh, when you're moving production back to a high cost society and economy like the US, then your costs are going to be higher. They're not going to be lower. So that's definitely a stagflationary impact. I want to mention real quickly the, the role of the, of the state, which is the word we use for the, your, the national government, you know, the federal government. And, you know, the, we all know about, um, insiders, favoritism, corruption. I mean, it's all, it's all ever present, right? It's, it's, it's in every nook and cranny of governance, but there is a proper role for the government in, in these kind of huge, um, problems we're facing. And, and, um, I'll just mention one, which is, you know, the government's proper role is to do what it can to encourage private capital to flow into productive use. For example, energy. Now, there's a lot of people that disagree with nuclear power, um, and then there's a lot of proponents of nuclear power. Well, you know, it, it's, um, I think it does have a role, and I think there's new technologies that deserve a second look. I don't think we should uh, preclude any source of energy, right? We should take a look at the new technologies with an open mind. Well, the government's proper role would be to facilitate this and speed it up. You know, instead, we have projects of, of not just in nuclear power, but other energy projects that take a decade to get approval. Now, that's just ridiculous. And so the, the proper role of the government is, 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 um, to, to speed things up where there's a clear path ahead and to make it attractive to private capital to be productive. And and so the, the government needs to step up its game here at all levels if we're going to get out of the stagflationary trap. And um, that, that was my point uh, with the, ro- the proper role of the state. Charles, I don't mean to be cynical. Is the government's a roadblock and a barrier to almost anything you want to do. And, may- and maybe for good reasons, but it's nevertheless a cost impediment. Yeah, and we, um, we, we can only hope for some kind of positive change in that direction. Um, then my uh, last point is the, the demographics, of, the global demographics are also stagflationary because – the um, birth rates have uh, been falling both in developed and, and uh, developing nations. And so the workforce is now shrinking in many nations, the, the number of people who are in the workforce. While at the same time, you the, the, um, the cohort of retirees um, and elderly is um, skyrocketing. And so there's going to be fewer workers supporting more retirees. And this is, is going to put tremendous pressure on um, the productive um, part of the society, right? Because you're going to have to take more of the earnings of the workforce in order to pay um, for the costs of the elderly. And so, you you know, I, the, if you study these charts, you can see that, like, for instance, Japan, which is a little bit further ahead of the demographic uh, trajectory, but it's like the number of people who are, you know, um, under 60 is plummeting and the, and the number of people who are over 60 is, is, is soaring. So that is inherently stagflationary. And so that's, um, those are my points that I wanted to mention that on top of all the financial or monetary problems, the, these are real world sources of stagflation. The demographics problem is just absolutely huge. We've all known about it for years. But it's now arrived. The baby boomers are retiring at 10000 a day. They're not spending them. They just don't. They've accumulated. Oh, the little bit. Those are the big buyers. Newer generations coming on have a whole different attitude. One, the Gen Xs through millennials, their educational costs and student loans that previous generations never had to face are so significant, ever mind the costs of apartments and everything else. Is just precluding them from being the level of consumers of housing and everything else that their, their, their parents had that sustained the 70% consumption economy. And now we get down into the, the Gen Z's, the Zoomers that are coming out. 
who have a whole different attitude to where they want to work and the type of work they want they they want to do and are not willing to just go along with the old kind of well this is the job I have to put up with they just saying I'm not going to do that my I want better balance in my life in other words the labor forces view of what they're willing to do as labor there's big pushback which is going to be problematic if companies are going to maintain productivity levels. And by the way, productivity is in, in the United States is in freefall right now because of a lot of these concerns. We've written about it extensively. These are all negatives and we will get through them over the years, but you know, it's going to create a lot of turmoil as we sort through these major shifts, social shifts, economic shifts, political shifts. You know, it's a fourth turning is real and it's happening. And all of our long-term cycle charts, so which we also did in our thesis paper, show you that they all kind of come together in about a three- to four-year window that we're currently in. And, Charles, we have actually showed some of your charts where you'd shown this back many years ago, and it would all kind of hit this uh, this point in time. The conclusions you know, that we can make are, you know, I, I think, anyway, best summarized as we're going to generally witness falling markets throughout the coming decade. But it is critically important that you are aware that this doesn't mean that there won't be major investment counter rallies that will feel like new bull markets. And as economic elements play out, expect volatility, major counter rallies, relentless downward movements, eventually chasing people from playing in the financial markets uh, at least to the extent that we're currently doing. It it won't be as an attractive area to spend all your time. It won't be as many people quitting to become day traders. We, it will quickly start to get out of, out of favor. The standards of living, we can expect to fall to match the uh, financial markets. I didn't say it's going to be a great depression of the 1930s. I'm saying falling, falling standards of living. It's going to be much tougher. Things like savings are going to come back into vogue because you just can't, you got to be protected from a rainy day, whereas before you just get credit, not going to be the case. Or what you're going to pay, you can't afford it. We'll effectively be transitioning also positively towards sounder money, a sounder money basis um, than we've had. That doesn't mean we're going back to a gold standard or anything like that, but the, the prudence that comes with sounder money, spending what you can afford to spend, not just putting it on a a credit card or creating it in the national debt or whatever. And as we've just said, standards of living, therefore, can be expected to fall. The wealth effect that monetary policy has delivered, as you just outlined, uh, Charles, can be expected to um, to reverse. The quantitative easing that we had for a decade was centered on bringing demand forward. That's the whole idea of stimulus. But if you bring it forward, it begs the question, doesn't that create a hole? Or is demand just going to go from 70% up to 80%? That's the problem with a decade of four levels of quantitative easing. So ever mind the normal business cycle that typically doesn't last 10 years, and we're into 12 years right now. So all markets will be much more volatile than we have been accustomed to, which will mean higher risk premium premia and equity risk premiums that we, that we mentioned earlier. Fiat currencies, this last chart here, Charles, have never historically lasted. And this time may be an exception, but the path we are currently following suggests otherwise. It doesn't mean the world comes to an end with fiat currency. It means we have to adjust with better balance that gets us back to better trade-offs between countries. And we can't have the United States consuming more than it produces and the rest of the world financing it. That can't sustain itself. And that's the core issue we're currently facing. The United States consumes vastly more than it produces. Any concluding comments, uh, Charles, you'd like to make? Well, that's a, that's a great way to end, um, uh, Gordon, on, on the, the eventual cr- credit and currency crises that, um, that you lay out in your roadmap. And so uh, what we as individuals and for our families and households, I, I, I think the, um, the correct response is like to become more self-reliant. In other words, don't count on the Federal Reserve or the government to like r- resolve all these problems uh, so that, you know, we can just live without making any changes or sacrifices. We're going to have to make changes and sacrifices. So we might as well take control of those and that will improve our standard of living going forward. Yeah, as individuals, we're going to have to be much more 
self-reliant, self-sufficient, and count on ourselves to solve the problems. Not turning to others or corporate company, or companies as employers or the government in that, for that matter. Um, it's going to be a challenging time, but it's healthy. It, the world has always never been an easy kind of thing. It has never been handed to anybody. I think the last, frankly, our generation, Charles, has been the most blessed since mankind. We've had it very, very good. And since the Second World War, it's been a phenomenal time, but, uh, cycles happen. And we go through these generational cycles, but we always come out stronger and better. That's the, you know, mankind is, has a history of doing that, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean you just play Pollyanna right now. Charles, we have to wrap. How can our listeners uh, catch up on your regular writings? Where would they go? Please visit me at oftwominds.com. Thank you, Gordon. We're always looking for feedback on any and all uh, tapes that we do, so uh, please send them along. Charles and I read them all. Thank you, Charles. Talk to you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.